All right, class, welcome to Friday. Uh, we've made it through two full weeks now uh, after today's lecture, so I want to congratulate everybody on, you know, kind of keeping up with everything that's going on, um, staying up with assignments, doing great on the exam that we had online. Thanks for hanging with Josh and myself as we got through the grading. Obviously, it took a little bit longer with having to, you know, hand grade, you know, 42 uh, people's short answer questions, but I think we came out with some pretty good uh, results overall. Overall grade for the class was the average grade was about an 88, which I'm really, really happy with. It shows me that you're, you're kind of grasping the knowledge. Uh, I really liked reading through some of the short answers as well because I feel like that enabled me to see how people are applying the information, which was great too. Um, so keep up the great work. On the other side of that, if you find yourself having a hard time, maybe you're, there are parts to the online lectures that uh, don't necessarily mesh with your learning style please reach out to me. Uh, I've been working with Dr. Smith a lot on this and the university as a whole knows that this isn't the ideal way to just in the middle of a semester switch from one method to another method. Uh, so there are a lot of resources available on campus. So I wanna reemphasize that, um, that don't think that you're you know, just not cutting it if you are having trouble with the current format. If there are things that I can do to make uh, your learning a little bit better, I wanna do those. The only way I can do them, if you guys reach out to me and let me know what those are. So please do that as soon as you can. Okay, let's try one thing here. Okay, I got my recording. I just want to make sure my microphone was on. Um, with that, let's move on. We'll do a little quick little example of what a graphical abstract is. I know in the homework I assigned that, but I didn't really give you an example yet. So I want to go over that real quick with everybody, just so you get a picture of what that is. Uh, then we'll do a quick review from Wednesday's lecture. And now we are moving into altitude. We're not talking about altitude in sports yet, but we're going to be talking about altitude, uh, like some of the basics of when a person moves from low altitude to high altitude, why does that make it harder to breathe? Okay, so let's move on. So here's a great example let's move this up, of a graphical abstract. This is from the Journal of Physiology. Uh, some people choose to put these types of abstracts in with their papers. What you can see here is this is just a picture that basically shows you what they measured during their experiment. What was measured? What were their hypotheses overall? So you can start here, have a person exercising. And I'm guessing that the theory is I haven't read the paper associated with it, so I'm just going to go uh, from what this picture is telling me. If they ha when they had people exercise, then they sampled some endothelial cells. I'm guessing those are probably going to be in the gut, um, but that's just what I'm thinking right there. So some endothelial cells, and what they're looking for is the estrogen response element, the ERE, okay? Um, and if they are giving exogenous estrogen to this person as well, they think that that estrogen receptor is also going to activate that estrogen response element. So there's two separate pathways here. If you have endogenous estrogen or are, are being given it exogenously, estrogen pathway fades with time after menopause. So after a person has gone through menopause, maybe getting that person to exercise and complete muscle contractions will assist with that estrogen response element. Estrogen response element is therefore going to increase the expression of nitric oxide synthase. Nitric oxide synthase is a um, kind of, it's a free radical that's very important in vascular, you know, where they go, vascular tone right down there. Okay, so what we're seeing here is normally in a person, a uh, woman before menopause, estrogen in their bloodstream is going to help with their estrogen response element. In this experiment, they're looking to see that if women after menopause, if they exercise, if they can improve that regulation of vascular tone, plaque reversal, meaning the amount of plaque in the vasculature, and arterial remodeling, all good things that are result in health. So from this picture, I'm able to kind of get a general idea of what the study is. It doesn't necessarily tell me all of the results of the study, but it tells me the hypothesis that are associated with. So this is what I want you to do. And, you know, the, the breadth of what a graphical abstract is and is not is pretty broad. I've seen ones that are mostly numbers and kind of some figures. I've seen some that are mostly pictures. And both can be right. So don't think that there is a hard and fast way to do this. Basically, what I'm trying to get you to do is take in content that's in a text format. 
and transfer that from text into picture or text into, into graphs. And the purpose of me having you do that is when you are forced by me, the professor right now, uh, to change the format of information from text into something else, that is when your retention is going to take place. So the purpose of me doing this is not because I'm really lazy and I don't want to grade written answers. No, the purpose of me doing this is hopefully getting people to think about data and think about the information in a research article in a slightly different way. And when you are, have to put that into a picture, your brain has to work a little bit differently. And my goal there is to help you to retain that information about altitude, specifically living high and training low, and why that might be good for exercise performance, specifically aerobic exercise. You're not going to get better at bench press from living high and training low. Okay? So let's move on. Quick review now from last week's lecture or from last Wednesday's lecture. Number one, how much oxygen can one deciliter of blood carry in red blood cells if an individual's hemoglobin is measured at 18 grams per deciliter? Okay, so let's start with what we know there. And what we know from this one right here is our 18 grams per deciliter. So if we know we have 18 grams of hemoglobin for one deciliter of blood, right? We want to be able to find out at the end mLs of O2 per one deciliter of blood. So if we want to keep the same denominator right there, we know we don't have to cancel that out, but we do have to change our hemoglobin over to mLs of O2. And we know that we have a constant that will help us do that because we know that one gram of hemoglobin is capable of carrying 1.34 mLs of O2. That right there gives us our conversion factor. So we know a person who has a higher hemoglobin is going to pay, be able to carry, if we multiply 18 by 1.34, let's move this a little bit here, will give us a value of 24 0.12 mLs of O2. And that's higher than what we said on Wednesday when our example was a person with 15 grams of hemoglobin. Basically, what we're saying is we have more of those hemoglobin subunits in the same volume of blood, and therefore the maximal oxygen carrying capacity of that same volume of blood is going to go up. We have more spots for that oxygen to bind. There we go. Okay, let's move on to number two. Why does incorporation of carbon dioxide into bicarbonate happen more quickly within the red blood cell? Remember, there are three ways that carbon dioxide can move into the bloodstream in general. Through uh, just simple diffusion and be dissolved in the blood plasma, it can be bound to hemoglobin, and the last one is that it can be converted into bicarbonate either in the blood cell, in the red blood cell, or in the blood plasma. Happens in both places, but we know it happens much more quickly within the red blood cell. And the reason that that happens is because of carbonic anhydrase. There's an enzyme that resides in a higher concentration within the red blood cell, and therefore, when that carbon dioxide moves into the red blood cell, the conversion of carbon dioxide plus H2O into H2CO3 happens much faster there because carbonic anhydrase can catalyze that reaction, make it occur at a faster rate. Okay, last one. Why does carbon dioxide move into the bloodstream at the muscle and into the alveoli at your lungs? So think about this. When we are at the, at the, in the bloodstream at the muscle, that carbon dioxide is moving from the muscle into the blood. And whether that be dissolved in the blood or attached to the red blood cell or converted into carbon dioxide, it has to move out of that muscle cell first. Then if we go to the alveoli, we're moving from the blood and from the red blood cells that are around uh, the lung tissue as well in that blood there into the alveoli. Why does that happen? The reason is partial pressure gradient. Okay. Let's 
zoom in here a little bit. Let's just draw a quick little two by two. It'll help us understand this a little bit better. Okay, so what we're going to do here is we're going to uh, label the partial pressures in the blood and in the tissue at the lungs and at the muscle. Okay, so in each of these boxes, we're going to put the partial pressure of carbon dioxide. And in the muscle, the blood has a partial pressure of carbon dioxide of 40 millimeters of mercury. But the tissue at the muscle has a partial pressure of 100 millimeters of mercury. Whoa. So which direction do we think this, this carbon dioxide is going to move? It's going to move from the tissue into the blood. Fantastic. Okay. Now, let's go to the lungs. The blood is still going to have a partial pressure of carbon dioxide. Well, it's going to equal out with that 100 of about 100. Because remember, we're going to move down our concentration gradient here to be able to saturate that blood that is right outside the muscle as it's moving away from the muscle. Okay, So when it gets to the lungs, it's going to have about 100 millimeters of mercury of, of carbon dioxide partial pressure there. Okay. Now, the partial pressure inside the tissue of our lungs is about 5. So which way is that carbon dioxide going to move? It's very easy for that carbon dioxide to move out of the blood and into the tissue. Look at that giant partial pressure gradient that we have there in the lungs. So that is telling us, when we looked at that picture that had the red blood cell and that had the tissue and it showed the carbon dioxide and oxygen moving, that's all being driven by our partial pressure of carbon dioxide, okay? So there we go. That's what's going to move our carbon dioxide either into the blood at the muscle or out of the blood and into the lungs when it reaches there so we can breathe that carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. Okay, let's move on. We're talking about altitude today. And here is a great table. I'm really bummed that the Summer Olympics have been postponed this year. Um, not because it's the wrong decision. It is the right decision to move them by, by year. But I love the Olympics. So much fun. I can remember uh, back into my childhood just sitting around watching the Olympics with my family on kind of, you know, that two-week period and just being mesmerized by all the athletes. You know, I never watch swimming. But when the Olympics are on, I will watch swimming for like five hours straight. I'll watch the heats. I'll watch the finals. It doesn't matter. I am into it. I know all about different strokes when it comes to that, um, you know, breaststroke, butterfly, everything. I know who's going to take what medal, and it's just such a great time for me. But if we think about the Olympics, it gives us a great window into what are the effects of altitude specifically for endurance exercise, okay? So let's look down our columns here. We've got year, location, and the winning time of the Olympic marathon. Um, and what we have is 1964. This is like every four years, basically. And we see, okay, 212. 220, 212, 209, 211, 209, 210. Which one sticks out here? Okay, not too hard to tell that we're talking about this one right here in Mexico City. All right, and I know that not a lot of people have uh, traveled to Mexico City. I I've, myself haven't, but if you don't know, Mexico City is about 7,000 feet above sea level. Pretty similar to Laramie, actually, with us being at 7,200 feet here. Um, and so you can see that the winning marathon time there was about eight minutes slower than the faster winning times, you know, uh, up to, you know, 9, 10, 11 minutes slower than some of the fastest winning times like Los Angeles. Okay, Los Angeles, right on the coast, zero feet above sea level. Huh. What does that tell us about the effects of partial pressure of oxygen on our ability to perform aerobic exercise? Well, from this, we can make a nice little simple statement that when you are at a higher altitude, your ability to produce force in aerobic exercise goes down, all right? Your ability to aerobically exercise goes down. So if you could previously run a 
uh, like let's say a 30 minute 10K when you were at sea level, when you move to higher altitude, typically above five, 6,000 feet, that ability is gonna go down. You're not gonna be able to run as fast, okay? So why does that happen? How does reduced partial pressure, oxygen partial pressure change sports performance? Here is our picture right here, okay? This is a great little diagram that emphasizes that column of air that's above a person's head. Here we are, right down here. Okay, so let's zoom in. See, I'll use a little bit different color. I'll use a white one. If we look at this person at the bottom of the mountain, the little box to the left-hand side says, look at all the atoms pressing down on the guy at the bottom of the mountain. We have this box right here, okay? Above this person. If you count the number of atoms that are in that box, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We got a bunch, okay? That is the pressure that's above that person's head. Therefore, we have there high pressure. Remember, not higher concentration. Same concentration of atoms above them. They're just, are, uh, yeah, same concentration, same percentage of the different atoms, but just they're closer together because they're getting pushed down from the atoms above. Number two, here we go. Look at this tiny little box. Here's a person at the top. And the box there to the left of that person says, look at how few atoms are pressing down on the guy at the top of the mountain. Aha. Uh -huh. So if we go right here, we see there's much fewer. One, two. That's it. And for this person at the higher altitude, we have a lower pressure overall. Okay. And so, One and one. We're going to talk about how partial pressure is good in green and how it's bad in red. And in green, we're going to talk about air resistance. And I'll date myself a little bit because when I was in I think middle school or something like that, the Colorado Rockies were an expansion team. And it was a huge deal. I remember I bought a Colorado Rockies hat as a kid living in Connecticut, never having visited Colorado before, because I was like, oh my gosh, there's a new baseball team. It is so cool. And the big thing, the first season that Colorado Rockies came in, you can look back at some of the records, the number of home runs hit at Coors Stadium was significantly more than any other stadium. And typically, you think of Coors Stadium not as a pitcher's stadium. It's more of a hitter's stadium because it's at higher altitude. If it's at higher altitude, there's less air resistance, which means that a baseball hit with exactly the same amount of force, we're not changing the amount of force production a, a batter can have when they stand in that batter's box and exert that on the ball. No, that's not going to be any different. However, the distance that ball travels with the same amount of force applied to it is going to be significantly more. So those warning track pop-outs that would happen at Yankee Stadium in New York, those are going to be home runs at Core Stadium if the distance to the fence is exactly the same. In all rationality, they should change the dimensions of the field a little bit to make it equal, okay? But so if air resistance is going to be good, and we think at the sports that that's good for Home run hitting. And in the past, we've had some members of the track and field team here uh, in the class, and they've said, hey, you know what happens? When I run a 100-meter dash at high altitude, the NCAA puts a correction factor on that time and makes it slower. Wait a minute. So you're running at high altitude, and they make it slower? Yeah, because there's less air resistance and running at 100 meters is not an aerobic sport. Same thing with throwing something like the shot put or maybe the disc discus. You have the ability to have that projectile go a little bit further. Sprinting. And one that comes in there as well that people talk about is, you know, maybe golf. 
because you have the ability to hit the ball a little bit further. This one kind of tends to be, you know, I'm going to put 50-50 in there because being good at golf is not all about how far your drive goes. I mean, you can look at some of the, the long drive champions out there. They're not in the PGA Tour for the most part because they can't chip and they can't putt. So golf is not only about how far you can hit the ball. It's also about, you know, those shorter shots too. So those are some sports that I normally come into. If you have ideas for some other sports that get benefited by being at a high altitude, email me. I want to talk about those because it's a really fun topic. Now, let's talk about low pressure or, yeah, when we were at altitude, what is bad? And this is generally going to be any aerobic sport. Marathon running. is the great example that we already gave of that right above. We saw that people were about eight minutes slower when they had to run a marathon at high altitude versus when they had to run a marathon at, you know, sea level, okay? So we know that marathon running is definitely going to be, have have trouble with that. Cycling. And I'm going to put time trial in there specifically. And cycling time trial, because cycling, you know, if you look at the Tour de France, generally they're going to be going over these giant 14,000 foot passes as a part of their uh, race. But the thing about that is all the athletes are going over the same environment. So the detriment to everybody's performance is typically the same or theoretically the same. Why do you think so many cyclists dope? Well, it gives them an advantage at all times when they're on low le- or they're at low altitude and when they're at high altitude as well. An example of kind of a 50-50 is a sport like football. And we can use football either in the American term or the European term. We can refer to American football or we can refer to European football, which we call soccer over here. Both of those are going to be kind of that 50-50. because we're going to have less ability to do some of that aerobic work. So potentially, you have the capacity to maybe get a little bit more tired towards the end of a game because you've been exercising, trying to go at the same uh, intensity uh, for that that total time. The thing with both of those sports is they're not necessarily an entirely aerobic sport. If you look at strikers going down, you know, kind of uh, who are streaking up front to try and score a goal in European football, Okay, they're running as fast as they can. They are sprinting. And that is for a short duration, and they have a long period of recovery. But if you think about some of the midfielders who have been shown to run about ten kilometers during the course of a race, six miles during the course of a fo- of, of a soccer game, those people are more aerobic. Do you think they're going to be a little bit more tired or not be able to move quite as quickly in some of those kind of back and forths? Absolutely. So once again, we'll say fo- football or soccer is going to be about fifty fifty for the benefits there. Okay, so those are some of our sports. That's some of our, you know, that's where we're starting. Now we're going to get into some of the why. Why is this different? Well, the first thing, if we want to know why it's different, is we have to be able to actually calculate the partial pressures at these different altitudes. So we're going to use some weather reports, okay? Here's a weather report from San Diego. Let's start right there. And what we're going to use is this value right over here. We're going to use the pressure, okay? So from this pressure, we are going to calculate what, this is the total pressure. So this is a weather report that you can see online, okay? Beautiful sunny day in San Diego, Uh, feels like 72, sounds great to me. Um, You know, we're going to have snow here this weekend. Um, So here we go. If we take our 30.6.06, that's inches, okay? Inches. Of mercury. Oh man, we're now we're in totally different units than we're used to because we've been talking about millimeters of mercury up to this point. Well, let's kind of do the conversion. If we multiply that 30 by our conversion factor, 25.4 millimeters of mercury per one inch of mercury, that will give us our total pressure. 763.5 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so that's our total pressure. But remember, 
we're really only concerned about the partial pressure of oxygen because it doesn't really matter how much the partial pre the total partial pressure is. All that matters is our partial pressure of oxygen. So let's do that conversion, and we know how to do that. We take our total pressure, 763.5 millimeters of mercury, and then we multiply that by our percentage of oxygen, which is 0 0.209302. And if we multiply those by together, we get 159.8 millimeters of mercury from oxygen. So our partial pressure of O2 at in San Diego on this particular day, when the pressure, uh, the atmospheric pressure was 30.06 inches is 159.8. Okay, now let's move to Laramie. And if we look, you look at the pressure right there and you're like, oh wait, for San Diego, it was 30.06. For Laramie, it's only 29.97. That doesn't seem very different to me. That's only what, uh, nine hundredths of an inch difference between the two? Well, the thing you have to know about weather reports is they correct for altitude. So this is a corrected value. So we have to uncorrect it to get back to the raw pressure. What was the actual pressure that was measured? Because what they're trying to do is be able to compare these between one location and the other without taking that altitude into consideration. So if we want to do our conversion factor, all right, the first thing we need are not conversion factor. We got to correct this or our UCF un This is our uncorrection factor. Basically, what we're going to do is we're going to take the normal, the standard 760 millimeters of mercury, and we are going to then subtract from that our altitude in feet, 7,200, oops, not Z, 7,220 feet. We're going to multiply that by 0 0.026. And the reason that we're using 0 0.026 is pressure drops by about 26 millimeters for every 1,000 feet of gain. Okay, so what this is doing is it's basically multiplying our altitude here in feet by this conversion factor and subtracting it from our traditional 760. What we're trying to get here is a conversion factor, a percentage that we're going to multiply our value by to uncorrect it. Okay, so if we do that, multiply that, then divide it by that 760, that's going to give us a conversion factor of 0 0.753. All right, so then what we have to do is take this pressure up here, 29.97 inches of mercury, and we are going to multiply that by our 0.753 conversion factor. Great. Then what we can do from there is multiplied by our 25.4 millimeters of mercury per one inch mercury. That way we can cancel those units out right there. Okay. And then the last thing we'll do, that'll give us our total pressure. Five, seven, three. So we know our atmospheric pressure in Laramie is 573. If we actually look at the amount of pressure on top of our head right now, it's 573 millimeters of mercury versus San Diego, where it is 763. So we have less pressure on top of our heads. Now, has the concentration of oxygen changed here in Laramie? No. So if we wanted to get the partial pressure, 
all we would do now is take this 573 and then multiply it by 0.2 zero nine three and that will give us our partial pressure one one nine point nine millimeters of mercury so if we move to this area right here ppo2 equals one one nine point nine millimeters of mercury whereas up here it was a hundred and fifty nine so what we're showing with this equation right here is just by changing the atmospheric pressure, we are changing the partial pressure of oxygen. Have we changed the percentage of oxygen? No. Have we changed the ability of work that that oxygen is going to be able to do? Yes. We are 40 millimeters of mercury lower in Laramie than we were in uh, San Diego. That relates to how much force is pushing that oxygen from out of the alveoli into the red blood cells and into your plasma, okay? So let's take a look at what that actually does. So we'll do, I think I'm gonna do purple and green here. I'm gonna change this up a little bit because that's what I have on a, a, a future graph. So if we wanna look at sea level and we wanna look at 14,000 feet, okay? Let me just make sure I got the colors right here. Yes, sea level is pur purple, perfect, okay? so. We want to talk about our partial pressure of oxygen overall. And we're going to do this at four different locations because the location of the partial pressure is important. We just determined in that previous figure up there when we were doing our equations right up here with San Diego and Laramie, the partial of pressure of uh, oxygen in the ambient air. And that's good. But that doesn't really tell us about how that oxygen is going to move into our bloodstream. What's more important is about telling that partial pressure in the alveoli. And then from there, we move to the artery. So in blood moving away from the heart, how what is the partial pressure of oxygen there? And then the last one is the partial pressure of oxygen in the vein. Okay. And what we can tell there is, once again, that's the how much oxygen went in, how much oxygen came out. We can differentiate there how much oxygen was then used. Okay, so let's start with our sea level. So like this one and purple. We start right here. We just said it was 159 in San Diego. We're talking about sea level, right? Sea level, San Diego, 159 is where we're going to start. However, there is a cascade that occurs between the ambient air and the alveoli. There's going to be a little bit of a drop. Remember, we're adding that water vapor pressure to it. So we're going to get a little bit lower partial pressure. Then we get a little bit further drop as we move into the artery. And then between the artery and the vein, we get a big progressive drop right there. There we go. And the cool thing about that big progressive drop, let's make this a little bit different. We go from about there to about there. This distance artery to vein is our a v o2 difference okay we're just talking about partial pressure here this is not the actual amount of, of uh, oxygen that's being utilized but we know that a v o2 difference is less okay if that a v o2 difference is going to be less because there's a, a or we know that there's a big change in the partial pressure between those two spaces if we know that there's a big change in partial pressure that tells us that a lot of oxygen is moving from one direction to the other, okay? Moving from inside the blood to outside the blood, into the muscle. Now, let's go to altitude. Here we are. This is going to be at 14,000 feet. The partial pressure there, we said in Laramie was 119 in for ambient air. But if you go up to base camp for Mount Everest, it's going to be about 90. The partial pressure of oxygen is down another 30 millimeters of mercury. Well, what does that do for the rest of your cascade here? Well, it's going to have that same amount of decrease for the alveoli. If you look at these two lines here, they're almost parallel. Okay, so you're getting the same amount of decrease because you're adding the same amount of ox or water vapor to that air. Now, same thing. We have a nice kind of similar slope here between the alveoli and the artery. But what you'll see is this last step 
between the artery and the vein. We almost have a continuation of that cascade. And what does that tell us? Well, if we want to calculate the amount of AVO2 difference from here to here, we're basically here to this. Look at how small that is. If we know that there is a smaller change in the partial pressure of oxygen between the arteries and the veins in people who are at high altitude, what that tells us is we haven't spent that much money. There's not a lot of difference between those two. That means not a lot of oxygen is moving from the bloodstream into the muscles. If not a lot of oxygen is moving from the bloodstream into the muscles, then guess what can't happen in the electron transport chain? There's no ability to accept those electrons and then create the ATP. We can't get rid of that hydrogen ion gradient to make ATP synthase, make some more ATP. So you can see that by being in high altitude, by starting at lower partial pressure, that is not where the story ends. The story is right here between that artery and vein. Okay, so from this figure, how can you tell that oxygen delivery is reduced? Less change in partial pressure of O2 between artery and vein. That's how you can tell. So let's now apply this. Let's look at our oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve and use the values from up here, specifically the alveoli and the artery, to tell us a little bit about this. Okay, so we know the partial pressure of oxygen we said was about 100. Okay, so if we are, once again, let's use our purple. Put that right there. Purple, make it a little bit bigger. Okay, so here we are. Partial pressure of oxygen is 100. If we're at 100, we go straight up, and then we go straight over. There we go. We're at about you know 90. Oh, there we go. Percent saturation, 97.5% saturated. Okay. And then if we look at, well, we're looking at the vein eventually. So we're here. That's our 0.1, and that's our 0 0.2. 0 0.1, and then we said what? 40 right there? Yep, 40. Cool. So if we go to 40, here's our 0 0.2. Go up to here. Draw that over. All right. If we look at 40, here we go, 75%. So we go from 98 to 75% is going to be the amount, our AVO2 difference. There we go, or the saturation difference. And if we're losing, you know, 75, 85, 95, 23 percentage, 22.5%, okay? If we're losing 23%, saturation, that means 23% is going into the muscle. Now, let's do our other one. High altitude. Avioli is going to be P1 here, and same thing. Here's our P2 down here at the vein. And in the alveoli, we have 50. Good? Good. Okay. So if we're at 50, look, we started a much, much lower partial pressure. Okay? We're 50 where we were 100 in our previous one, and a lower saturation as well. We're at 85% where we were at 97.5% before. But how we kind of make up for that is with this right here, because now we're at about 30 And if you look at 30, okay, we're in a steeper section. If you look at the grade of this right here, let's do this. Okay, that's the grade of that one. And now we're going to go to the purple one. You can see that the slope 
of that green line is much steeper. So for a change of only 20 millimeters of mercury of partial pressure of oxygen, we have a very big drop. That slope is steeper compared to the slope of the purple line right there, where we have a drop of 60 millimeters of mercury, okay? And in this case, we're going from 57, 67, 77, 87, almost 30% loss. Green. So even though our partial pressure of oxygen change is a little bit less or is much less as far as this is concerned here, we still have the same ability to get oxygen off of the red blood cells into the into the blood. We've shown that here with this figure. So even though before we were saying, hey, how do we how can we tell that less oxygen delivery is reduced? while well, we have less change in partial pressure of artery than the vein, that's not necessarily true because we ran the numbers here and we're showing that even though we are decreasing the partial pressure by a smaller amount, this sixty, this is twenty, even though we only go in one third of the amount of decrease because we're in a steeper section of the curve, the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve, we still have the ability to um, take that oxygen off. The problem becomes when we move down here and get even lower and we start exercising because then we're going to be at the same partial pressure in the veins between the both. But the difference is, oh, we started much lower in our altitude model versus our non-altitude model, okay? So the big thing I want you to take away from both of these is this shows you the cascade of partial pressure of oxygen, but here is how you can apply it to actual oxygen delivery. So if you wanted to really answer this question from this figure, how can you tell that oxygen delivery is reduced? You can't. You need the curve. Ta -da. So let's move on. Let's talk about how your body responds. So we have this difference in the partial pressure of oxygen. And what we need to do is we need to change some things to enable you to move more oxygen. Okay. So the first thing that happens is you're going to increase your breathing frequency. What this does is when you increase your breathing frequency, it makes the air that is in your alveoli more similar to the ambient air, okay? When you breathe faster, you exchange more air between your alveoli and the space around you. These are not just shallow breaths like the, you know, like Casey the dog. No, these are nice deep breaths as well, but they're just occurring more frequently overall. Your total pl uh, pulmonary volume is gonna go up as well, okay? When you hyperventilate in this method. What that's gonna do is it's going to increase the partial pressure of O2 in the alveoli. And it's going to decrease the partial pressure of CO2 in the alveoli. If you have an increased partial pressure of oxygen, let's say this alveoli was moved from here up to here because of your ability to breathe a little bit faster, well, what that's going to do it's going to increase that partial pressure of oxygen and it's going to result in more saturation of hemoglobin. Great, we can move more oxygen from our lungs to our blood, uh, to our muscles then. But number two is kind of more, in, uh, well, this carbon dioxide, hold on, before we move on to the changes in the blood, this change in partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the alveoli results in one really negative aspect that we're going to relate to exercise down the road. We're going to have a decrease in our bicarbonate situation. So bicarbonate concentration goes down. That's because you are breathing off more CO2. If that gradient from your blood to your lungs is going to be greater because that partial pressure of carbon dioxide in your alveoli is now lower because you're breathing more, 
Well, guess what? More carbon dioxide is going to get sucked out of your blood. If you had more carbon dioxide sucked out of your blood, that means your bicarbonate concentration is going to go down. And besides bicarbonate being used to hold CO2, it also acts as a buffer. Remember, it's negatively charged. What happens if you add some extra hydrogen ions from contracting muscles to that? Well, the bicarbonate can neutralize those so that your pH in your blood doesn't change. But if you have less bicarbonate, guess what? You can neutralize fewer positive hydrogen ions. Okay, So that's a negative aspect of uh, the initial reactions to moving to high altitude. What happens in the blood? Well, your hematocrit is going to go up. And I know everybody right now is probably thinking, wait, your hematocrit is going to go up? How can your hematocrit go up? I thought having a high hematocrit was something that was associated with like blood doping when you gave people extra red blood cells. Well, we're kind of doing it in a funky way. So your hematocrit, remember, is just the ratio. Okay, so let's draw our blood tube here. Here's our blood tube. And let's make this a little bit bigger. Here's our red blood cells that sit in the bottom of that blood tube, remember. And here's our plasma that's on top of that. I'm going to do this in two little sections like that, okay? And generally, what we'd say is, okay, if we were to measure this entire area and then break it in half like that, you know, over to here, we'd say in this circumstance, well, we'll just say 40% of that total blood volume is made up of red blood cells, and therefore, we're going to say this person's hematocrit is 40, okay? Which is pretty normal for a person at, you know, at sea level. What's going to happen when you get rid of this plasma volume, when you move to high altitude? Well, we're going to get rid of that plasma volume right there. You're not getting rid of red blood cells. You're not changing the number of red blood cells you have. You're just reducing the overall. So this is, oops, this was normal. And then now this is altitude. Now, 60% of your total blood volume is made up of by red blood cells, just because you've gotten rid of the other component of the blood. So in effect, we are raising our hematocrit here. Okay, hematocrit goes up. What that's also going to do is it's going to increase your hemoglobin concentration as well, but your plasma volume is going to go down drastically. Okay, after six days, though, what's going to happen is the signal is going to start going that our overall blood volume is down. And we're going to start making some red blood cells. And we do that by increasing EPO, erythropoietin, which will do three things. It's going to increase those red blood cells. It's going to increase our hemoglobin. And it's going to increase our hematocrit. Overall, we're also going to get a re-expansion of our plasma volume. So after about six days, that's when these start happening. Uh, you're going to need about 21 full days for this to kind of get back to normal. You have if you move to Laramie, remember those first three weeks were probably pretty hard if you move from an area of low altitude. Okay. So let's do one last exercise here to really show how an increase in hemoglobin relates to the oxygen carrying capacity of the blood. Because we're going to increase our hemoglobin after six days. So let's say well, I've been in Laramie now for um, you know five years. My hemoglobin is probably higher now than it was when I was living uh, in Arkansas before this, okay? So theoretically, I'm thinking, hey, if my hemoglobin's a lot higher now, shouldn't I be able to run faster? Let's consider my fitness is exactly the same as it was. My hemoglobin is, is higher now, so I should be able to run faster or run, you know, a 5K in a faster time. I haven't been able to do that here, not because I've gotten less fit, probably, but also for physiological reasons as well. So let's do the math, okay? So we're going to start on one side with our normal. 15 grams of hemoglobin per deciliter of blood. 
and we're going to multiply that by our 1.34 mLs of O2 per one gram. This is going to give us just our maximal oxygen carrying capacity. We know in this first one, this first example, before I was at altitude, okay, my maximal carrying capacity was 20.1 mLs of O2 per deciliter of blood. Okay, now on the other side, we'll say, okay, I've been in Laramie for five years now. My hemoglobin is now 19 grams of hemoglobin per deciliter of blood. What that means is I can carry 1.34 mLs of O2 per one gram of hemoglobin. My maximal uh, oxygen carrying capacity is now 25 mLs of O2 per deciliter. Oh, wow. Moved up 5 mLs of oxygen per deciliter. Well, that's a big deal. How can I relate that to exercise capacity? Well, remember, at sea level, okay, here we are. At sea level, that partial pressure was 100. Oops. All we're doing is really calculating the how much oxygen you're actually carrying in these situations. So, how much oxygen am I carrying here at sea level? When my hemoglobin was 15 grams per, uh, per deciliter, how much oxygen was I carrying? What was my percent saturation? Okay. Well, let's use this color again. We'll use purple. We'll go a little bit thicker. We're at 100. We draw it across. Remember from before, we had this at about 98%. So before I was at, when I was at sea level and my hemoglobin was 15 grams per deciliter, my maximal oxygen carrying capacity was 20.1 mLs of O2 per deciliter. And if I multiply that by the percent saturation at, at low altitude, which was 98%, that tells me how much oxygen I'm starting with. So 19.7 mLs of O2. Now, I've acclimated. We'll use the Everest on that. Now at Everest, I've been there for three weeks. I've gained all the hemoglobin I'm gonna gain. I'm up to 19. My maximal oxygen carrying capacity right now is 25 mLs of O2 per deciliter. But we have to go here. Remember, we're starting at 50. Bring this up. Bring this over. What we have here is our oxygen carrying capacity when we are at Everest is only 80%. We can only saturate about 80% of our red blood cells. So even though I have a higher maximal oxygen carrying capacity, if I multiply that, by 80%, okay, that's only going to equal 20.4 mLs of O2 per deciliter. So we have a smaller percentage of a larger hole, and therefore they're going to be equal. So you start with exactly about the same amount of oxygen, even though your hemoglobin has gone up. So what I'm trying to show with this last picture here is over time, the adaptations to being at altitude is you will eventually have a higher hemoglobin and a higher hematocrit than you did when you were at low altitude. But you only do that as a way to kind of, you know, uh, slow the decrease. You can only get back to about where you were. You can't get better if you're at high altitude. So my ability to exercise at high altitude is not better here than it is here because I'm carrying the same amount of oxygen from my lungs to my muscles. What we're gonna get into eventually is how can we kind of hack this? How can we use the benefits that we get at high altitude to then go down to low altitude and use an athletic competition? Does that work? That's where we're gonna go when we talk next Monday. So let's leave it here for today. Um, I think that's it for the, the notes. Yep, that's it. So let's leave it here for today and I will see everybody on Monday. Send in your questions.